Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I have been waiting. We're now a minute past our scheduled starting time. Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the participants who are still uh, joining. And so to try and make sure we don't um, lose too many of them, I'm just going to wait a few more seconds while we get uh, most of them into the room, as it were. Thanks, Yvonne, uh, for saying hello. Um, let's let's um, let's crack on. I think we've got. It looks as though we've got most of our participants in the room. Uh, let can I please then in in uh, welcoming you. Obviously, I'd like to extend the warmest possible welcome that we can extend in a in a in a medium like this to this virtual panel discussion. Uh, I just need to run through a couple of housekeeping matters, which I hope will help all of us to get the most out of this kind of webinar experience. Um, as participants, <clears throat> you are all automatically muted. So no fears about uh, uh, the dog barking or any other domestic or office uh, noises disturbing the, um, uh, the webinar. Uh, and we're also not using the chat functionality, which has been disabled. Uh, but we do want you to ask questions, please. Uh, we're here to engage as much as we possibly can in a discussion uh, and not a sort of one-way lecture type of format. So please do uh, um, ask questions. And for that, uh, we are using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So for questions, the Q&A tab. I'm facilitating. My name is Chris Todd, uh, and I'm a partner in the firm Bowman's based in South Africa and ordinary, ordinarily resident in Cape Town. So I'm facilitating, I will do my best in addition to uh, getting the panelists to tell you uh, what we want them to tell you, uh, to uh, gather up any questions that come through on the Q&A tab and we'll try to deal with all of those uh, in the course of the hour that we have set aside for it. Um, for, we're not going to provide written responses, so you'll have to rely on me to uh, to get those questions to the panelists. And the webinar is being recorded, uh, so a copy will be available on our website later today at uh, www.bowmanslaw.com. So those are the housekeeping matters. A brief introduction before I tell you who we have on our panel. Um, this is a, a part of a series of discussions that we've had uh, with our clients uh, and experts, both partners or other lawyers within our firm and some of our best friends outside of the firm, grappling with the extraordinary impact that the COVID pandemic has had uh, on all of our lives, both at home and at work. And for many of us over the past few weeks, for many people, that's probably been the same thing. Uh, but importantly, we're not alone when grappling with these problems. Our jurisdictions and the particular jurisdictions that we're going to talk about today haven't been uniquely singled out by the impact of COVID. Uh, we're battling a global pandemic and employers and workplaces around the world have been affected in much the same way. Uh, we have, in common with many other countries in different continents, now reached a stage though, where most employers, many employers, most employers are trying to get the workplace, or get employees back into the workplace as much as possible to restore production in the way um, that it's necessary to do. And that has presented a, a whole range of very difficult challenges in different jurisdictions. So the real purpose of our discussion today is understanding what particular rules, regulations, practices, or experiences uh, we must now expect uh, in the workplace and adapt to. So, while the pandemic is global and we, um, uh, we have, have a lot of shared experiences, we do live in different countries with different legal regimes and the responses and the timing of those responses haven't always been the same. And that does make it important for us to have panelists from across different jurisdictions. And I am delighted to be able to introduce you to the panelists this morning from our East African offices uh, and from South Africa. And they're gonna help us discuss the new reality facing employers across our regions. 
So to the panelists, and then I can uh, uh, take a back seat. Uh, in Kenya, we have Rainbow Field, who's a partner in our office and uh, delivering much of our employment law service in that jurisdiction. And also Ariana Isaias, who is our specialist in Kenya on uh, protection of personal information, which is an important topic that we are going to talk about today and uh, comes up specifically in this context. Uh, so thank you, Rainbow and Ariana. Uh, and then in Uganda, from Uganda, we have Jackie Lule, um, who has a partner in that office and also um, has already established herself as a specialist in talking to large groups of people through this medium, Jackie. So thank you and thank you for letting us twist your arm again. Um, in Ethiopia, from Ethiopia and our best friends in that jurisdiction, Ermias Chernet joins us uh, and to share their experience in that jurisdiction. I last looked and didn't see uh, Wilbert on the line and so we'll discuss Tanzania uh, in passing either with or without Dr. Wilbert Kapinga, who is, uh, was scheduled to join us. And then last but not least in South Africa, Lusanda Rapulu is the head of our employment practice in Bowman's. Uh, and she's joined by Nadine Mather, who is our, I don't know if it's right to say our version of Ariana, uh, but in any event, our personal information specialist uh, in South Africa, uh, where we've actually had some uh, very recent developments that we'll talk about. So that is the panel. Thank you very much to panelists and to all of the participants uh, for joining us. Um, and I'm going to crack on then and start uh, Rainbow, if I may, uh, just by way of introduction, we go across our jurisdictions just to tell us exactly what is the situation in terms of uh, workplaces, uh, in, in, in terms of the COVID situation in your jurisdiction. Are you, have you been in a lockdown? Are you emerging from it? Can you just give us that overview? Uh, and we'll take that across the different region. Rainbow? Sure, sure. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. So in Kenya, we have what I would call a, a partial lockdown. Uh, we had our first positive case in, in March, 2020, and we're now just teetering on the edge of 5,000 cases. And since then, the Ministry of Health has consistently asked employers to, to put in place various measures and systems for, for the implementation of health guidelines uh, for the mitigation of the spread. But we haven't seen any specific changes to um, our, works, our workplace limitations other than specific sectors. So uh, the hospitality and um, tourism sector has been affected because there have been restrictions in terms of bars and, and restaurants, but we are seeing now that those restaurants are, are being allowed to open up a little bit more. We've had a curfew since 25th of March, and initially the curfew was from dusk till dawn, 7 p.m. till 5 a.m., but it has been extended a couple of times, and, and we're now on curfew between 9 p.m. and 4 a.m. So the government hasn't expressly stopped people going to offices, for example, but they have, they have provided a number of measures that they have recommended to, to stop the, the transmission. There have also been some containment measures for different uh, counties. So currently we're not allowed to leave Nairobi uh, and people are not allowed to come into Nairobi other than essential services. And also in Mombasa, there have been some containment measures. Uh, but there haven't been any express rules implemented about stopping people going to work. And we are starting to see uh, a lot of offices looking to reopen in the next few weeks. Thanks very much, Rainbow. And that's, that really sets the scene for what we're going to talk about in a moment, which is the practical consequences of that in your jurisdiction. But Jackie, can we move across to you and talk about Kampala uh, and maybe it's a good uh, an opportunity to talk about how different or the same it is to the position in Nairobi. Um, thank you Chris. Hello everybody. Um, in Kampala even prior to the actual first case diagnosed um, the president um, by directive uh, closed all public gatherings, hotels, schools, churches, 
anything that had over about 20 people um, on the 18th of March. And in the week that followed, um, what happened was we had public transport closed. We also had a curfew um, like our Kenyan neighbors, except ours is from uh, 6 30 in the morning, 7, 7 o'clock in the evening to 6 30 in the morning. Um, and all shops were closed except uh, food shops. And markets were closed unless the people could actually sleep in the market uh, in order not to take um, the risk home. Uh, factories were allowed to remain open uh, if they could accommodate employees within the factory so that they also couldn't go home. Um, courts were closed. Uh, uh, except for the most urgent cases uh, and of course bail applications um, and the uh, government uh, tried to impose um, or to make live uh, some ICT guidelines for courts to function you know through um, the use of um, ICT. That's sort of work but not too much. Um, what then happened is that in terms of employment there was no um, law or anything but the government directed that people should not sack people unless they had to that they should rather lay them off temporarily ask them to go on leave or for example um, reduce their working hours or even reduce pay uh, the government was very clear that they didn't want anybody to be sacked they also told landlords you can't uh, evict people during this time um, and, and that kind of thing but all that was really directive uh, there was no state of emergency as may be in other places. Um, we, had, we did get one statutory instrument um, later, but essentially everything has been by directive of the president who gives addresses every so often and by the Ministry of Health. Um, since the middle of May, we have started to see a gradual reopening. Um, we, initially, there was no public transport allowed, but now public transport may operate with up to a maximum. So if, they, if let's say, for example, you had a matatu or taxi, as you might call them, that carried maybe 14 passengers, you're now only allowed to carry seven. And everybody must have a mask on and there must be social distancing within the taxi and there's also sanitizing and washing hands. Um, private cars, we were initially only allowed three people in a car once we started reopening. Uh, now, as of day before yesterday, you're allowed to have up to four people in a car. Um, and so businesses are now reopening slowly, uh, but uh, again, uh, the, there are various regulations that we shall talk about uh, uh, as to how you can reopen. So hotels and restaurants may reopen, but only for takeaway. Um, until, as, and then as of Monday, they may reopen for sit down customers, but only if you can do social distancing. Um, offices like ours have been allowed to reopen, but you are required to have um, PPE, so uh, masks must be worn at all times. Um, there must be hand washing facilities or sanitizing. Um, there must be social distancing. And so, for example, if you come into the bank, which is the building in which Bowman's is in Kampala, um, you must have a mask, otherwise they don't let you in. Um, and obviously, they've made adjustments for that. But the president has also emphasized that stay at home if you can. So a lot of businesses have got employees still at home uh, and just trying to work. And some people are working in shifts. So maybe you come in twice a week or only come in when you're required. But otherwise, people are staying at home. The one business that seems to be firmly closed is hairdressers. So if you see some of us sporting afros, that's the reason. But for some reason, the president has deemed it far too dangerous to have hairdressers open, so they, they remain closed, but otherwise all businesses are reopening. So our conversation today is opportune because of course people need to know what they're supposed to be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, can we go to Ermias uh, to tell us in Ethiopia, uh, lockdown, no lockdown, uh, and are you experiencing a change in, now, in the sense that we're now facing a return to work, uh, which has been disrupted. Uh, thank you Chris and all the participants. Uh, from the Ethiopian perspective uh, there has not been any official lockdown despite uh, numerous measures that the government is taking uh, by way of such as uh, a state of emergency decree 
which contains uh, different restrictions on people and businesses. So uh, all in all, uh, businesses are open in Ethiopia with, ex with the exception of uh, uh, those in the hospitality, uh, those who have cinema, bars and uh, nightclubs are officially closed and uh, uh, operating this sort of business uh, is a violation to the state of emergency decree and uh, it, it, it entails criminal liability uh, to the owners and those who take part in those kinds of activities. Uh, otherwise, uh, every business is open in Ethiopia, although the government is encouraging business owners to keep most of their uh, workers to stay at home and work from their home. Uh, the government also uh, take into consideration of some sort of tax incentive for those businesses who are allowing their workers to stay from home while they are, they are on payroll. Uh, so there are different measures, uh, such as uh, different measures and restrictions, such as uh, every business owner is required to provide uh, safety and uh, uh, sanitary equipment and tool to every of uh, its workers. Uh, it has to ensure, every business has to ensure uh, physical distancing uh, measure is strictly uh, implemented uh, at the workplace, uh, in the cafeteria, as well as uh, while workers are, are using uh, transportation services. Uh, again, the state of emergency required every business owner to provide transportation service to its workers. Uh, and also there are uh, some serious restrictions imposed on uh, every employer, such as uh, termination measure. Uh, in no circumstance is an employer allowed to take a layoff measure uh, despite its business condition, despite it loses most of its business, it's not uh, completely allowed uh, to take a termination measure. Instead, uh, the government, through so the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, adopted what is known as workplace protocol. And that protocol uh, listed down uh, progressive measures that employers might consider before engaging themselves into termination. And these progressive measures include uh, measures such as uh, reduction of all benefits, not including basic salary, uh, such as forced annual leave, but paid one. Uh, and also in circumstances where a business is a very, in a very critical uh, situation, it might consider to arrange a sort of law uh, which the employer has to uh, provide to its workers and, and make some sort of temporary suspension of the employment relationship. Uh, so uh, no employer is allowed to, to, to make termination. Uh, and this uh, uh, suspension, this uh, prohibition of termination extends also to uh, disciplinary cases. Uh, we are facing a uh, lot of uh, inquiry from our, our clients uh, who, had, who had been seeing uh, various disciplinary breaches in the workplace and they were considering to automatically terminate uh, uh, some of uh, their employees because of uh, disciplinary misconduct, but unfortunately uh, they cannot do so and we advise them to take less severe measure before uh, jumping into termination. Uh, in, in, in a very serious uh, uh, disciplinary uh, breach cases, and if termination must be inevitable, uh, employers have to involve the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs uh, in order to uh, give them a sort of green light so that they can consider termination of uh, employees who are uh, in, in uh, disciplinary breach. So all in all, uh, uh, in the Ethiopian context, there is no complete lockdown. Uh, businesses are open. Uh, there is no curfew as such. Uh, there are some restrictions on employers, which I have already presented. 
and also restrictions on transportation, both public and private transportations. They cannot carry uh, beyond, I mean, they, they can use only 50% uh, of up to 50% up to of the carrying capacity of uh, their vehicles. Uh, so in order to compensate the adverse effect of all these restrictions, the government uh, introduced a sort of uh, tax measures, tax incentives uh, for, uh, for employers uh, who keep the, their employees uh, paying every month. Uh, so it is by way of postponing uh, the period of declaration of the VAT they have collected from their services uh, and also some sort of reduction in their um, corporate profit tax. Uh, this is generally what is happening uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, just to add uh, something regarding uh, uh, quarantine measures which the government has been adopting. Previously, uh, the Ethiopian government has uh, passed a decree uh, to put everybody incoming into the country to stay into government arranged 14 days uh, forced, forced quarantine measure. But uh, just last week, the Ministry of Health tried to ease this measure and uh, it has introduced uh, a sort of uh, clearance. For example, if a passenger who comes from the state or any other country uh, having an evidence showing that uh, he or she has been tested negative for COVID for the past, 20, uh, the past 72 hours, uh, that person will be allowed to stay at his home. Uh, and the, th those people who do not go through uh, testing and do not have any sort of evidence with regard to their negative status, uh, the quarantine period was reduced from 14 days to uh, seven days. So these are uh, some of the things on the ground in Ethiopia. Thank you very much, Hermes. In fact, what is interesting about all three of those jurisdictions, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, no formal lockdown uh, and you've just described a whole series of measures which are, in fact, very proactively intended to keep businesses running during the COVID crisis in tandem with, um, uh, uh, with, with the other kind of, of, of social distancing restrictions. So when we complete the circle now, uh, Wilbert is not on the line, but we do know that in Tanzania, there has been no lockdown or any formal interruption of economic activity uh, during the... Uh, during the COVID pandemic. So possibly of the jurisdictions we're talking about, the most laissez-faire, if that is the right word for it. And then down to South Africa, Lusanda, where probably from the sound of it, we've had the most onerous formally regulated lockdown. Um, but do you want to just, uh, for, our, for our participants, um, uh, sketch briefly what the current position is in South Africa? So in South Africa, we started off with a very hard and formal lockdown, um, which started just before lock, just before midnight um, on the 26th of March. Um, and at that stage, only essential services could be performed um, and otherwise people were to work from home. Um, the government put in place a scheme called the Temporary Employer Employee Relief Scheme um, in terms of a UIF system to assist those uh, who were um, impacted in their workplace um, because of, of the lockdown. Um, we've had a gradual easing um, of the lockdown um, and uh, um, in, a, in an effort to flatten the curve um, and where we are now as at the 1st of June, um, I think for all intents and, and purposes our economy is open um, so long as businesses are adhering to the health and safety measures, um, adhering to uh, social distancing, the wearing of face masks, um, etc. Um, in the past few days, um, you know, there was an announcement that even the restaurants are now open um, for sitting down. Um, hair salons and the beauty industry, grooming industry is open. Um, subject to um, complying again with um, social distancing, health and safety measures. 
Um, so at, at this stage, um, three months down the line, um, we do have, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, an, an open um, economy. But yes, we started off with a very um, hard and formal government-imposed uh, lockdown in terms of the Disaster Management Act. So thank you very much for that, Lou. And I, I want to now, I mean, that, it's a good point to, from the overall regulatory regime. So what employers actually have to do and what are they doing to manage having employees back at work during this period. So I, I want to come and ask you that question, uh, Rainbow. One of our um, participants did ask um, and say, well, is it all about hand sanitizer at the entrance, one meter or whatever the prescribed distance is and face masks? That seems to be, you know, that's, is that, is that it? What are the what are the what are the measures that employers are either required to adopt in in uh, to get back into into the workplace in Nairobi or uh, what is the practice? Thanks, Chris. So the restrictions that were imposed from the very beginning included the physical distancing of two meters, mandatory wearing of masks in public, um, some restrictions on public transport, which I, th I think everybody else has also. Um, referred to, we had restrictions in terms of allowing only only ability to carry up to 50% of the declared passenger capacity. So for Matatus and things like that, they're certainly running very much under capacity. Um, and the fact that business owners were required to provide hand washing stations and sanitize their premises. Uh, but because we've never had a formal uh, restriction in terms of returning to the workplace, uh, there, there haven't really been any regulations issued in, in that respect. However, we have seen recently, at the beginning of June, the Ministry of uh, Industrialisation, Trade and Enterprise issued some guidelines for business operations during COVID-19. So those guidelines have included a lot of other recommendations um, in terms of reopening of the workplace to the extent that the workplace hasn't been opened or to the extent that you now want to make sure that you're adhering to those guidelines. So the guidelines aren't, ha aren't actually in, in law yet, um, but they have been issued. So most of the measures are ones that everybody is already aware of. So things like social distancing, making sure that you've got the, the hand washing capacity and the sanitization. Other measures that they have recommended in, in, in the guidelines include no handshaking, hugging, um, encouragement of cashless transactions, encouragement for staggering shifts and rotating staff mem members, and encouraging the engagement of clients through phone or internet platforms, clear workstations um, for wholesalers such as supermarkets, they should clearly mark appropriate distances for customer spacing, which most of the supermarkets have already implemented. And then where possible, employers should arrange transport for staff so that they can reduce their need to use pu uh, public transport. So that there are a lot of uh, measures that have been recommended for, for the return to work. And there, I mean, I could, I could go through them all and there, there are a fair number of them, uh, but we are actually working on a return to work pack at the moment, which we're ready to roll out. And I know South Africa has done the same to give clients some guidance on what they should be doing if they're ready to return to work. Um, on top of all sorry. of that, sorry, Chris. Go ahead. I was going to say, on top of all of that, we also have the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which requires employers to make sure that the health and safety of their employees is insured. Uh, and the Act also provides that they have to carry out appropriate assessments for risk in relation to the safety and health at work of employees. So that's been standing pre-COVID. Uh, but obviously employers are going to be more aware of that requirement now. Um, when I was going to interrupt you, Rainbow, it was to say you have mentioned masks and temperature checks, which are two of the mm -hmm. more, I don't think you would call them invasive, but certainly they've been more controversial uh, mm -hmm. 
in managing this public health thing? Is there, are there directives or recommendations in either of those in the Nairobi context? Yes, so the guidelines also provide that it's recommended that you should measure temperature of employees using thermometers before they enter any uh, warehouse pre premises and as a general measure to test temperature before people are entering into a workspace. Um, hand washing was a, was a recommended restriction from the very beginning. So mm. that, that's ongoing. Um, when, it, when it comes to the sanitization and things like that, there are a lot of uh, guidelines on cleaning, disinfection and protective gear. So there should be regular disinfection of high touch surfaces, etc. regular disinfection of the workplace and any tools of trade, hand washing stations, proper management of waste where there's PPE being used, limiting numbers of people, um, and even to the extent that work, the, one of the guidelines is to ask your employees to bring their own cutlery to, to the workspace. Okay. So there are a number, but that's not in law. This is at the moment, just a guideline. Thanks very much, Rainbow. Um, uh, Dr. Kapinga has been able to join us. Wilbert, uh, you're currently video off and I saw it come on briefly there so that our uh, participants could see you. You may or may not be surprised to know that I gave a very brief rundown of the situation in Tanzania um, based on, on my best available information. But we are, we're going to come to, back to you in a moment uh, because we're now talking yeah. about any specific measures that are being required in individual workplaces. For now, you're very welcome and we're delighted to have you on the panel. Thank you, uh, Wilbert. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for coming late. Uh, I, I lost my laptop, so I had to struggle between uh, that and my phone. So I'm around. Thank you very much. Um, Jackie, you heard what Rainbow said um, and I understood you in your introductory session to say these were presidential directions or directives rather than uh, regulated um, matters. On the other hand, you said you can't go into a building without a mask. Um, any other particular measures that employers have either been obligated to or as a matter of practice are having to adapt uh, in, in Kampala? Okay, um, so Chris, the, on masks specifically, actually there is now um, a statutory instrument that makes it mandatory for everybody to wear a mask as long as you're outside your place of residence. So that is a specific requirement and anywhere you go, you should have it. The enforcement is a different question. Um, the other thing that um, has happened is that there is what they call the public health control of COVID-19 rules. And one of the things that it does for, uh, uh, in, in respect of employers, is to place an obligation on anybody in charge of a premises and every employer um, who becomes aware of somebody who's suffering from COVID-19 within their premises or area to notify a medical officer uh, or take that person to for medical treatment. So that's just one thing uh, in addition. But generally, as with the Kenyan experience, it's really about guidelines and directives and Ministry of Health directives um, as to um, what you should be doing. So uh, the masks are mandatory as per law. Temperature checks, there's nowhere where they say you, you, you must have them, but we do have them. Um, and I have to say, Chris, we in Uganda don't make a fuss about them. We've had them for years here when you come in and out of the airport because of course we've battled um, Ebola virus and other viruses. Um, so what I would say is that um, for em employers, there is the guideline, the, the sort of directives from Ministry of Health and Presidential, but as with Kenya, there is the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which makes it mandatory for an employer to protect as far as possible the work environment to avoid hazards and to make sure that they are protecting their employees. So that is in law from long time ago. Um, but also then it places a duty on the workers or the employer, employees to make sure that they take care of their reasonable care of their own health and that of others and not to do anything that might cause a risk to other people. And so I think because of the obligations of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, it then means that an employer has to think if there is no specific law, the specific directive about something, an employer has to think, well, what should I do uh, to make sure that I'm complying with the law? 
Um, we don't have any specific guidance, but apart from masks and sanitizers, and I saw the question from Paul, um, shifts, I think, are quite important. So you don't have too many people in the office at the same time if they don't need to be there. Um, most, uh, and, well, not most, but a number of officers that I'm aware of have stopped the use of a canteen facility. So uh, a canteen where everybody congregates at lunchtime, sits down, eats and chats. Um, a lot of employers are saying, no, actually, people will go in and get, get food or the food will be given out at people's desks or whatever, but not to be sitting down in a, a sort of collective um, situation. And also the transport point that um, Rainbow made again, um, some employers are saying, look, we're asking their employees, where are you coming from to get to the office? Um, uh, and, and either arranging um, transportation for, for them or trying to ensure that in coming up and down on public transport, that they're not being exposed to the virus or actually um, transmitting it to other people. So what I would say is that, yes, the guidelines and, uh, and directives are perhaps vague, but the obligations under the Occupational Health and Safety and Health Act mean that you have to think a bit out of the box and make sure that you are um, doing what you need to make sure that your employees are safe. So that's, thank you, Jackie. Um, Rainbow, I'm actually coming back to you now to deal with one of the questions that our, our participants are asking. And that is something that I think employers have been very anxious about is what what are their obligations? How onerous or how far reaching are an employer's obligations and what medical attention and what level of medical attention or care do they actually have to provide to employees who test um, positive? And that's a question I'm going to, uh, you, you get it first because that's who someone has asked, Rainbow, but I'm sure. going to go to Lou and uh, uh, Ermias in uh, Ethiopia, Lusanda to see if there's any kind of, if, we, if we've got any kind of common standard that's developing here. What do employers, are they responsible for, for people who test positive with COVID-19 and how, how, how far does that obligation go? Thanks, Chris. So under our Employment Act, uh, employers are responsible to provide medical attention to employees. Obviously, it doesn't specifically say, say in relation to COVID, uh, but that obligation only extends to the extent that you are not contributing to NHIF, which is our National Hospital Insurance Fund. So where employers contribute to that fund, that obligation falls away and it's compulsory to contribute to that fund. So in a sense, provided employee, employers are actually adhering to their obligations under NHIF, then it's arguable that those, uh, those obligations are fulfilled. Well, it's not arguable, they are fulfilled uh, because they have been contributing to that fund. We haven't received any indication of other specific laws that are under consideration for additional obligations for employees who are infected with COVID, whether at the workplace or not at the workplace. But just going back to just going back to the information under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, they do have that obligation to make sure that they are safe at work. Um, so I'm, you have to excuse me for a minute, my child's screaming. That's all right. I, it's a good opportunity for us to go to, uh, uh, to Ermias because your comments that you described in Ethiopia, a measure of protection uh, and most, many jurisdictions have had either a, a, a law or a decree or a request that employers should not lay off workers during this period. Uh, your comments, your opening comments, uh, that in Ethiopia it's gone further so that you can't even discharge workers for um, acting against the interests of the company. Uh, that's produced uh, a question to say, uh, is it really so that under the emergency decree, you can't, uh, you actually can't dismiss workers, even if they are acting contrary to the interests of the company or are bad performers? And uh, maybe you, we can just confirm or clarify that point. I think I heard you say that that would require permission from the from the uh, regulatory authority or the Department of Labor. Uh, any uh, any further comment, and that's in response to Jamala's um, uh, question. 
Uh, that is very interesting. Uh, look, uh, this is a kind of question that we are expecting from uh, anybody who is interested uh, in Ethiopia, particularly as an employer or re employer representative, because it sounds strange uh, not to have uh, a sort of right to terminate an employee or a worker who really uh, goes against the interest of the company. Uh, I expect that sort of question. The thing is, uh, we have uh, the state of emergency decree and uh, it's very clear in the state of emergency decree, uh, decree it says no employer in the private sector, uh, the, I mean the law, put it uh, in a, some sort of qualification, meaning it doesn't cover uh, public enterprises owned by government or public se sector uh, employers. But uh, those who are in the private sector cannot terminate any employee uh, for whatever reason uh, in contradiction to the guideline which is envisioned to be said by the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. So we were expecting the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs to come up with those guidelines that would enable uh, uh, employers to take disciplinary actions at least. However, uh, as we speak, the Ministry of Labor and Social Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs did not come up with uh, such directive or indication uh, enabling uh, uh, employers to take at least disciplinary measures. Therefore, in the absence of such guide guideline, no employer is allowed to take disciplinary measure. Instead, uh, if a disciplinary measure is considered by uh, an employer, it has to be taken into the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs or to the regional offices of labor and social affairs so that they would consider the matter, the gravity of the offense, and they can, they can give a sort of green light in order to terminate an employee. Otherwise, it's absolutely a no situation. That is unfortunate, I understand. Okay, thank you very much, Hermes. Um, well, I do want to bring you in here because I when, I, when I said I had described the position in Tanzania, we mentioned that there had been no formal lockdown. But one of the questions that's coming up is, and we're trying to engage with our, to what extent are there control measures that are either enforced or recommended in Tanzania for businesses while they continue? So no lockdown, but are there requirements for either physical distancing, for wearing of masks, or for temperature checks, which are the three main ones um, that we've talked about. And, and those are the main ones that questions are coming through. Uh, by the way, just when I, I will try and answer your questions, but if you ask a specific question about a requirement, it would be useful to mention the jurisdiction as well, um, so that I know where to direct your question. But Wilbert, um, just on, on the position in Tanzania, no lockdown, but are there mm -hmm. requirements or recommendations on? Yeah, yeah, indeed, uh, indeed. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Sorry, I I came in late. I I kind of uh, lost my laptop and got disoriented. Um, so yes, there's been no lockdown, um, and this was not by default. The head of state said specifically he is not going to lock down Dar es Salaam because it's responsible for eighty percent of tax revenue. Indeed, he was not going to close down borders because he feels obligated that uh, landlocked countries like Zambia, Burundi, and Rwanda should be able to get their um, you know, imports through the ferry to those countries. So he's not going to do that. And that is what has happened. Uh, however, he said, but we need to take precautions. And these included, of course, social distancing. And he himself would not shake anybody's hands. He will greet them by, by you know, using, uh, using his shoe and be jokeful. So social distance is being uh, uh, imposed without any regulation. Of course, the use of sanitizers and washing hands. All of that is being encouraged and recommended. 
for safety purposes. And the Ministry of Health was in the forefront of that. And masks were, of course, also recommended. And for a while, even the minister himself and the prime minister were wearing masks when appearing in public. But there was really no, no, no regulation. Now, because there was no lockdown, the issue was, was, was uh, how do employers deal with uh, the situation? In government offices, business was as usual. In courts, they said, okay, we, we, we recognize there's this problem. We'll make sure there are no crowds in our registry rooms. So if, if there is a, a place where there are more than uh, three people, we'll make sure only two come in the office so that they have enough space and they come in uh, in turns, like uh, by shifts. So that was one way which was recommended, but there are no rules. And then some courts, like the commercial division, is doing most of its business online. I've, I've been receiving rulings and judgments online. They've set up a portal just for, for that purpose. And the Court of Appeal continues to, to, to hear cases, but they're all masked and they've, they've done the right social distancing where council seat, where parties sit, there's good social distancing and masks are a requirement. You don't turn up in court without the mask. They will turn you away and adjourn your case to some distant date, but there's no regulation in place. Only the Chief Justice sent out the secular to say this is how we will deal with, with the situation. Now, regulatory offices, for example, yesterday I was in two places at, at the um, telecoms regulator. At the door, of course, there is a sanitizer, okay? And you need to wash that up. But you get into the building, you see no one wearing a mask other than the guards at the entrance. So we had to keep our masks on because we don't know it's just a foreign place. We had our meetings there, we didn't shake hands, we left. So there is like an unwritten rule about social distancing and the use of masks. Those who feel uncomfortable, they probably don't use them. We went to the competition authority yesterday. The only difference I saw there, at the reception now, they put a glass pane. And I asked, hey, this is a new construction. I said, oh, COVID. We want to be sure our stakeholders who come here don't, are not infected by us or they don't infect us. And the conference room had enough social distancing. No one was wearing masks, though. We kept our I think I was, on. so I think it was fair to describe it as laissez-faire in the sense that there's no hard lockdown, but actually no, ab absolutely. a lot of initiatives to try and manage social distancing. So yes, well, that's I, have to, I have to spend, so I've got a bit of time, I have to spend some time now on the um, protection of personal information. And yeah, partly sure. this is from a question asked by Paul Migwi and focusing on Kenya. Um, mm -hmm really talking about the potential stigma that is associated with uh, with an office where somebody tests positive with COVID and mm -hmm. our employers expected to manage that. Um, and it probably, Ariana, I should probably start with you rather than Nadine because Paul is directing this question specifically to Kenya. Um, contact tracing, personal information, stigma, how is this regulated in Kenya or if at all? Thanks, Chris. Um, and Paul, thanks for your question. So uh, Kenya actually, and uh, quite fortuitously, only recently passed its first Data Protection Act back in November, and that was seven years in the making. So the timing of the act was actually very good, particularly because, you know, obviously one main way in which we are going to be able to combat uh, this pandemic and also to enable governments and companies to, to control and contain the spread of the pandemic is through data. Um, and uh, one, uh, one concern that actually has been raised by, by a lot of people here is that the, uh, the, the authority that will essentially enforce and, and, and oversee the implementation of the act, which is the data commissioner, has yet to be appointed. Um, but uh, what was uh, a very positive development was, uh, and, and similar to how we have in Uganda, 
we have regular announcements made by the Ministry of Health and actually on Sunday, which marked uh, the 100th day uh, of our first case in Kenya, we had the Cabinet Secretary for Health and the Cabinet Secretary for ICT making a joint statement. And they've actually acknowledged and, and made a statement that the data commissioner will be appointed in two weeks time, uh, which is fantastic. I don't think it will happen in two weeks time because the, uh, the a list of the potential candidates has actually only been published and they are due to be interviewed on the 7th, but it does mean that the data commissioner is coming and that will mean that going forward, once, once he or her has been appointed, uh, there will be stricter enforcement of the act. Um, and, and one point which I thought was, of, uh, of, of ver which was very interesting and, and I would like to highlight is what the CS, uh, the CS for ICT, so Information Commun Communications and Technology said that we want to protect privacy, but also to ensure the public safety first. So I can see that privacy is at the forefront of, uh, of a lot of the regulations. Um, on that point of uh, the potential discrimination, so health, health data and rather the health status of an individual is, uh, is treated as sensitive personal information uh, under Kenyan law. And, uh, and, and one, uh, the, the guidelines that, uh, that Rainbow mentioned, which are again very similar to, to Uganda, uh, the, rule, the various rules and regulations and guidelines which require essentially reporting of people either in your household, of close family members, um, by, uh, by landlords, by employers, by owners of premises to, uh, of, of any cases that they, that they know of or any suspected cases that they know of to public health officers, there is a concern that there may be some discrimination or victimization. Um, one, one way in which employers should really make sure that they can um, you know, calm, calm these fears of employees is to make sure that only really individuals that need to know that information of, uh, you know, if one of their colleagues is infected, only those uh, employees should have access to that information. Uh, and also not sharing information with your other colleagues, you know, so making a, a company wide announcement that colleague Y uh, has come down with the virus, for example. So those, those are ways of, um, of, of being conscious and, and essentially treating that information uh, as, as it deserves to be sensitively and confidentially. Um, one, one key point that I do want to add is, so under the Act, sensitive personal information is, is as I said, is, includes health data, it also includes biometric data. So for example, at, at Bowman's, I know that we, are, we have stopped to take uh, you know, any biometric information because that's also one of the methods in which you're, we're trying to limit uh, you know, common touching of, uh, uh, touching of common areas. Um, but biometric information as well as, as health data cannot be transferred out of Kenya uh, unless you have the consent of that individual and the consent has to be express consent. So particularly for companies who operate in, multi in multiple jurisdictions, that's something that they're really going to have to look at uh, from in terms of their privacy notices or, or any of their employment agreements which, which refer to any processing of data. Um, because now that we do have this act, you can't just do what you want with it, essentially. Um, and going on to the con, I can touch upon contact tracing later. Um, well, no, but do it now. You, you won't get another chance because then I'm going to ask. <laughs> you to draft a position no, no problem. So, I mean, it's, with the contact tracing, you know, uh, Rainbow mentioned the the various rules and regulations that we have, and that I suppose is our traditional form of contact tracing. We don't have these surveillance big brother apps that you might have or that may have been reported in South Korea or Israel for that matter. Um, so, so a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, we do have forms that, that persons are required to fill in when they leave Nairobi or enter into different count counties. Um, and there is, there are, there have been some rumors uh, that the government is actually using the services of our national intelligence services to essentially monitor uh, locations uh, of, of, uh, of users through their mobile phones. I've certainly received messages from the Ministry of Health, but those are more public statement messages. So I, I don't think I'm being traced, but that, that, that there is, those are, those are one possible use of the technology. Um, and then finally, we have an, in, an initiative called Nyumba Kumi, which was initially launched uh, as a, as a um, to support counter-terrorist movements. And it's essentially a form of community policing. Uh, and in Swahili, it means 10 households. It's now actually been used by the Ministry of Health and, and quite effectively, uh, I might add, 
to monitor cross-border cases. Um, and the Ministry of Health has asked communities in those border counties uh, to report anybody that is coming in and out of, uh, of, of the country to the authorities. Some really difficult questions about reconciling managing public health through information and contact tracing versus privacy where personal data is protected. Nadine, you're, you're up uh, in South Africa. What are we doing about this and how, does, how do those tensions, how are they reconciled? Thanks, Chris. I think um, in South Africa, given our strict measures that have been put into place by law in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Directive and also the regulations, a lot of personal information has been processed by organizations to try and combat COVID-19. Um, and amidst all these measures that have been implemented to flatten the curve, the president announced on Monday that our South African Protection of Personal Information Act, at least the majority of the remaining provisions, will come into force on the 1st of July. Um, employers will, however, have a grace period of 12 months with within which to ensure compliance. So they would have to ensure that they comply by 1st of July, 2021. But having said this, the information regulator and the president have already um, encouraged and strongly suggested to organizations to start complying and to ensure compliance as soon as possible. Um, in terms of, of South African law and the, the reasons for processing information, one of, one of the grounds or the justifiable reasons is when it's an obligation imposed by law. And a number of the measures imposed in organizations currently like screening employees, um, you know, taking their temperatures, reporting um, positive cases to the Department of Health, assisting with contact tracing, they're all legal obligations. So you don't necessarily require an employee's consent, even though similarly to um, Kenya, health information is regarded as a special form of information. If it's done for purposes of complying with a legal obligation, that is justifiable in terms of our act. So in terms of weighing it up currently, there's a lot more focus on public safety and legal obligations as opposed to, you know, the privacy of an individual um, sort of outweighing the one way as opposed to the other. Um, in terms of contact tracing, you know, our, our department has established a national um, tracing database where they're trying to collect as much information as possible um, in order to track and trace individuals that have been suspected to have been in contact with someone who has tested positive. Um, employers specifically have an obligation to assist the Department of Health with these contact tracing measures. So that would include collecting information from your employees relating to who they've been in contact with, their identity number, their names, their cell phones to assist with the process. So it's a, quite regulated currently in South Africa. Um, although our, our actual main piece of legislation is not yet um, in force. Thank you very much, Nadine. Um, I, I want to just, there, there are lots of questions that have come in that are on quite specific topics, difficult to put them all. Uh, Jackie, in uh, one of the, the topics that, that has been raised in the, specifically in the Ugandan context is uh, shift work, which I think you mentioned in one of your sort of opening addresses. It doesn't seem as though arranging work in shifts is in any way with a 14 day incubation period of COVID, it doesn't prevent the possibility that um, uh, that there will be transmission in the workplace. So I don't know if you've got any, I don't think anybody's going to be able to wave a magic wand and say employers are now sterilized from, or employers can guarantee their staff, they can be at the workplace and not be at risk of infection. But I don't know if you've got any wise words uh, about how that situation is, is mitigated. And maybe if you need to offer those wide words, we've reached kind of the end of our time. Maybe I can ask you and, and Dusanda and maybe Ermias just to make some closing comments here. Uh, are our homes workplaces? How far do employers have to go to actually guarantee staff that they're not going to become ill in the workplace? Has this changed fundamentally because of COVID? Okay, Chris. 30 seconds to answer that question, okay. Jack. Uh, take it, take it, if you don't mind. The shift work doesn't prevent people getting COVID. What it does is that it reduces the number of people in the office. So less crowding, less likely for people to actually get it from the workplace. So that's yeah. the, the thinking behind that one. I don't think you can extend the workplace to your home. Although I know certainly in the UK jurisdiction, sometimes um, if people are employed to work from home, they do come and do a risk assessment. But I think that's a different situation. 
my, my final thoughts are really an employer has to be adaptable and has to be compliant. You have to adapt to the situation, accept what it is and adapt and be compliant. Do whatever is required uh, to make sure that you can keep your business open. That's all from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jackie. Ermias, do you want to just weigh in? Uh, you, you had quite a long introductory section, but anything that people have said that you want to just close off by mentioning uh, from an Ethiopian perspective? Yeah, it's uh, really a challenge for uh, employers to 100% uh, ensure or guarantee the health and safety of their workers. But what is really advisable for every worker is to uh, comply uh, with uh, the guideline uh, put in place uh, in the state of emergency decree as well as the workplace uh, protocol. Uh, so they have to provide uh, health healthcare uh, utilities like uh, equipments, they have to ensure physical distancing and monitor the situation and uh, report to the relevant government institution if there is a suspected case. Otherwise, it's really tough and uh, I should say impossible to 100% guarantee. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hermes. Lusanda, uh, any closing remarks from a South African perspective? Um, I think from a th South African perspective, um, the reality is that employers um, are going to have to have in place for quite some time um, measures in place from an occupational health and safety perspective to, um, you know, have in place hygiene measures. Um, I think they will have for some time to have to have measures in place in relation to vulnerable employees, uh, those over 60 and those uh, with existing conditions. Um, uh, working from home re remains the strongly recommended way of working to the extent that it's possible. So I think employers in South Africa will need um, to the extent that it's possible in that workplace uh, to continue to allow employees uh, to work from home and to deal with the various complexities uh, that come with that. Okay, I see general nods and maybe I think I, with our time up, I should wrap up. Uh, and say thank you very, very much to our participants. Well over a hundred of you. It's been fantastic engaging with you to the extent that this is uh, an engagement. Thank you very, very much to the panelists for your contributions. What I'm hearing, uh, and I don't know if that's an accurate summary, is whether there are strict laws, uh, emergency decrees, or um, uh, specific legal obligations for employers to manage their workplaces in a particular way, or a set of guidelines, uh, either non-binding guidelines or presidential recommendations in, as in Uganda and Tanzania, uh, employers are best advised to effectively do their best on best available information to make their workplaces uh, safe. And if they do that, uh, they will have um, at least a, a proper argument that says we, we recognize there's no zero risk here. There is no uh, guarantees, but um, we are acting as responsible employers with proper regard to the best available public health information and directives from, uh, from our governments. Um, I don't know if that's an accurate summary, but I think that's about all we've got time for. Thank you very much, Rainbow, Ariana, Nadine, Ermias, Jackie, Lusanda, and Wilbert, again in absentia. It was fantastic to have you on, even if only for a short period of time. Uh, and until next time, thank you to our participants.